Okay, we can also record this scenario with a velocity versus time graph. And I can say, okay, from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., I'm moving a constant rate of 75. And so I could see that it would just be a line segment from 7 to 9. And if I started to look at this, if I thought of this as a rectangle here, what is the area of that rectangle? So this is a distance of 2. This is a distance of 75. 2 times 75 equals 150. Okay, and pay attention. We moved from a velocity to a distance. And really all we're doing is finding the area under the curve. That's all an integral is now is finding the area under a curve. In this, way, in this case it was a straight line, but we're finding that area. Differential calculus was finding the derivative, slope of the tangent line, all of that. Now we're focused on the area under a curve. Okay. Now, what if that train moving along the track at a varied rate of speed? It wasn't a constant 75 miles per hour. From some time A to B, what is that total distance traveled? I put on here, well, what does this graph look like? And so this would be my velocity versus time graph from A to B. But now my velocity is varying and creating a curve. It's no longer a straight line, a straight horizontal line. So from the last example we knew, if we found the area under the curve, that would give me my distance. Well, this one, how do we find an area under a curved line segment? Okay, so this one doesn't create a nice geometric rectangle or square like we had in the last one, oh, not a rectangle. So this is where integration comes into play. Now we can focus on finding areas under curves. What's that? Okay, we will use small rectangles. So, yep, I think I know what you're saying. Okay, so how do we find the area under the curve? We're going to partition that area into small rectangles and then find the area of each of those. So if we took our same curve there and I drew a bunch of straight lines, vertical lines, now I have a bunch of rectangles. I have a little curve at the top of my rectangle, but still. Now, if I found the area of each of those rectangles and added those up, that would give me an approximate area of what I'm working with. So the first tactic we're going to have is using geometric shapes. Okay, How can we use shapes to be able to find the area under that curve? And we're still going to be working with an approximation of what it's going to be. We'll get to a point where we can do it exact, not today. But we'll get to a point where we can do it exact, but we're going to start out with approximating what that area under the curve is going to be. All right, so our area of each rectangle will be the height of the rectangle times delta t. So delta t just means that change in time, okay? So the height of each rectangle and then the width would be delta t. What's that? Two rectangles? Okay. Nope, we're going to do them with vertical ones for now. Okay. So when I say height of my rectangle, for this case, really I mean V of T, because that will give me, V of T will give me my height times delta T. All right, and you don't have to write this down, but what this is getting to, 
remember when we were doing with differential equations, we had delta t and like d dt kind of to represent that change. Okay, so that's going to come into play here in a little bit, not today, but just kind of a preview that that delta t is important, how much that's changing, because we had those differential equations where dy equals, say, 5 dx. Well, this dx we can think of as that change going on. So we'll get more into that. Okay, so finding the area of the curve using several rectangles is called the rectangular approximation method. A very creative name they came up with for that. Or you can just say RAM for short. Jacob. Not yet. We're going to get to that. Okay. So finding the area of the curve is rectangular approximation method. We're using multiple rectangles to approximate the area of the curve. Now we have three different types of rectangular approximation methods. We can go off of a left endpoint, which would be LRAM. We can go off a midpoint, MRAM, and a right hand endpoint, RRAM. And what that looks like graphically, if I wanted to find the area under my blue curve on here, and I used left-hand endpoints, meaning the left top corner of my rectangle is going to touch on the line, that's what it would look like. So if my blue curve is concave up, I can see I'm going to have all these rectangles with the top left corner touching on that line. Now we could probably already see some deficiency in using LRAM on a concave up increasing function that this one actually will create an underestimate because there's those little pieces that are not being accounted for by my rectangles. So I have gaps under my blue line before I even hit a rectangle. So as long as it is concave up on an increasing function, we have an underestimate using LRAM. MRAM will take our tri or I'm sorry, rectangles to the midpoints of the top segment of our rectangle. That will lie on our curve. So we can start to see that MRAM is a little more accurate because I don't have those gaps underneath my blue curve. So I have some gaps underneath my blue curve, a little bit smaller gaps, but then I also have some rectangle that's going above my curve. So it's starting to cancel each other out a little bit, but it's getting a more accurate picture of what that area under the curve would be using rectangles. And then RAM. The top right corner of our rectangle will be touching on the line, and we can see that that is going to be an overestimate for this situation. Okay, this is concave up. If it was concave down, it'd be totally different. But for this specific, these graphs, using the right hand on an increasing function is going to be an overestimate because my rectangles are going above the line. To find that area. Easy enough, right? Okay, so let's take a look at an example. It says a particle starts at x equals zero and moves along the x axis with a velocity function given. Okay, and so if I were to make a graph here. It's going to be some velocity graph, so v of t on my y-axis, 
T on my horizontal axis. So T squared plus 5, it's going to be an increasing function with 5 as an intercept. It's going to look something like that. Okay, where, we're going to talk about where, they're talking about position, where is the particle at time t equals 8? So they give us a velocity function, and they're asking us about position. So we have to integrate. We're going to do our integral from this. Approximate the area under the curve using four rectangles of equal width and height determined by the midpoints of the intervals. Okay? Okay. And so we're going to have four rectangles of equal width, and we want to know all the way out to eight. Show us one more time. So, look where it's at. Okay, so now we're using midpoints, and we want four rectangles. So, if I'm using four rectangles, my interval goes all the way out to 8, how wide are my rectangles going to be? 2, okay? So my midpoints are going to occur at 1, at 1, at 3, at 5, and at 7. So my rectangle is going to go, oops, Something like that. So here's at 2. Here at 4, it's going to cross right here. So my drawing is not the best, but you get the idea that it's that red line is going to cross through. Okay. I'm going to go up here to 6. It's going to cross here at 5. So mine are not equal width. But we get the idea. So being midpoints is specific. So we want to make sure our midpoints are now at 1, 3, 5, 7, and 8 wouldn't be a midpoint. A would be an end. All right. So if we wanted to find the area under the curve, we're going to add up the areas of all the rectangles. So the area of rectangle 1, so I'll do A sub 1 to represent the area of rectangle 1. is going to be my height of my rectangle. Well, my height of my rectangle is going to be V of 1, because the highest point is going to be at that midpoint. So if I do V of 1, that puts me right on my red line, which is the height of that first rectangle. Times the height, which is just 2. So if I do V of 1, I'm going to have 1 plus 5, which is 6, times 2, which gives me 12. If I look at the area of the second rectangle, this is going to be V of 3 times 2. So V of 3, 3 squared is 9, plus 5 would be 14, times 2 will get me 28. Area of my third rectangle would be V of 5 times 2. 5 squared is 25, plus 5 is 30. Then it being 60. And then my fourth rectangle, V of 7 times 2. 7 be 49, plus 5 be 44. End up with 88. So I find the area of all of those rectangles, and then add those together. Add those together, I end up with 208. Yes. What's that? 
88. 44 times 2. Oh, 54. There we go. 108. Still ends up being 208, though. Thank you. I was getting ahead of myself. 54 times 2, 108, to end up being 208. Okay, so this is all we're doing. You just find the area of each rectangle and you add them up. Okay, you're going to be giving intervals and they'll say, okay, on this interval, do this many rectangles. So an easy way to remember this, if you're trying to find out your delta T, your width of each rectangle, all you can do is the width of the interval divided by the number of sub-intervals, or how many rectangles they tell you to do. So in this case, the width of our interval was 8, and they told me to break it into four rectangles, and so I know the width of each one would be 2. All right, that's pretty straightforward. We did that in our head. But when you get into more and more problems, or if they get into fractional ones or something like that, this little relationship is helpful. Okay, just take the width of your interval, divide it by the number of subintervals. That would say the width of each rectangle. All right, same problem. So that one we end up being 208 was our area under the approximate area under the curve using MRAM. Um, okay, how would this change now if we used LRAM? Okay, so we have our same same graph going on. We have our same curve going on. It's going out here to a distance of eight. But now if we use LRAM, our left endpoint needs to touch. And it would be a width of two. Our next would go out to next would go out to four. This one would go up a little bit from two and then over to four. Next one would go to six, so it goes up a little bit from four all the way out to six. And then our last one would go up and touch. It would look like that. So the top left corners of our rectangles now are going to touch. So now the area of each, so the area of the first rectangle is going to be V of zero. Okay, because that's where my top left corner is touching at zero. So I'm going to do V of zero times two. So zero would equal V of zero would be five. Five times two would get us ten. Area of our second rectangle would be V of two times two. Two squared is four. Eighteen. Of our third would be at V of four times two. We have 4, 16, plus 5, times 2, 42. Okay, so we can see now, same situation, but using LRAM, we get a smaller number. And we know on an increasing function, LRAM is an underestimate. So this one's end up being 152. Okay, let's do a quick one for right just to see. So with our right, again, we're going to have that. We're still going to have our intervals of 2, going all the way out here to 8. But now 
this corner is touching, and going down here to six. This corner is touching, going to four. This corner is touching, going to two. And this corner is touching. So now the height of our first rectangle, that far left one, the area of that first one is going to be V of 2 times 2. We get 18. The area of the second one is going to be V of 4 times 2 to get 42. The third one is going to be V of 6 times 2 to get 82. And then the area of the fourth one would be V of 8 times 2 to end up with 138. We add all those up, we end up with 280. But we know this one is an overestimate. Another thing we should be able to recognize, all of these were multiplied by 2. So we could also write this as 2 times V of 2 plus V of 4 plus V of 6 plus V of 8. You can do it all like that in one step. Okay, Your delta T is always going to be a constant. So if you find all of your heights, add those together, multiply by 2, you get the same answer. Okay, so when we work through these ones, MRAM ended up being you know, MRAM 208. LRAM was 152. And then RAM ended up being 280. I will tell you the actual area under this curve is 210.67. Yep. Okay, but that actual number, we will get to how to do that next week. Okay, right now I want you to be at a point though where you can do the approximation of it. Jacob. Practice. Well, well, you you've done this already. Where we will get to the point where we don't even use approximation. We can do it exact, but this is kind of building the foundation of how we find that area under the curve, or how the calculator finds it, which is going to be even easier for us soon. No, this is this is as fundamental as it gets. After today, besides on a on a test or something. You won't have to do anything specific. Okay? Mm, kind of, but this is easier than limits. <laughs> okay? So, just in general, for an increasing function, LRAM is an underestimate, RRAM is an overestimate. Okay? So, if we had some sort of an increasing function, if we had a decreasing function, then LRAM would actually be an overestimate and RRAM would be an underestimate. So in your math Excel problems, they're going to have you do stuff with MRAM, LRAM, RRAM, and ask you about how this, this approximation method, how accurate is it. No, one more example. Um, no. And I'll tell you, it's a math Excel question that I always, students always struggle with this one. So we're going we're gonna to work through it together a little bit. So at least get started. Because this one gets into, can you picture what's going on? Okay. All right. So this is, this is one of your... Math Excel problems, you'll probably have different numbers than what's on here, but I want to at least get you started on this one. Okay? So 
you don't necessarily have to write this one down word for word because like I said it's going to show up in your math Excel but you want to write down the math workings of it because when you get to this problem you recognize it from what we're doing here okay to estimate the volume of a solid hemisphere of radius 6 so this one they're asking us about the volume of a solid so you could think of like half of a golf ball or something Imagine its axis of symmetry to be the interval from 0 to 6. So that's what they're talking about. This interval here, this horizontal axis. I'm going to change my color. This horizontal axis here is the axis of symmetry. That's what they're talking about. So on the interval from 0 to 6, don't think of that as a coordinate 0, 6. It's the interval from x equals 0 to x equals 6. Partition this interval into six sub-intervals of equal length, and they, they'll give you a diagram here, and they've done this. So we have six sub-intervals here. We can see there's six rectangles going on of equal length and approximate the solid with cylinders based on the circular cross-sections of the hemisphere perpendicular to the x-axis at subintervals, left endpoints. Okay, so this is an LRAM that they got going on here. And it might be hard from, to see from the back, but the top left corner of each rectangle is touching on that curve. Find S sub 6, which means the volume of all six cylinders. Okay, so let's get an idea here what's going on. So we have these rectangles going on. But these rectangles, we're looking at a golf ball cut in half from the side. So these rectangles, if I were to change this, it actually is a cylinder if I were to lay it on its edge and think about it 3D. Does that make sense? You can think about it maybe like a, a quarter, like a piece of money, a quarter. Okay? If you put it straight up and down, you look at it, yeah, it looks like a square. But if you move it, you can see it's a, it's a cylinder. It's a circle, and it has some height to it. Okay? Well, here we recognize this change here, or well, we'll just say this height of my cylinder is going to be the width. Okay, if I were to, I laid it down so we could see it as a cylinder, but if I stacked it back up how their picture shows us, it looks like a square, or I'm sorry, a rectangle. So that height is actually the same as the height of each rectangle. Okay, now the radius of our cylinder is going to be this distance from here to here. Okay, so think of it from our, our x-axis all the way up would be the same as our radius. Well, they give us this function here, y equals root 36 minus x squared. That is this curve. So you can't see it very well, but behind the, the red boxes, this blue curve going on is this function right here. So I can say that if y equals that, then my radius is 36 minus x squared. Okay? Because this is giving me my distance y from here to here to the line. If I put in 3, then I put me right here on the line. Okay? That's giving me halfway across my cylinder. So that's my radius. So the same thing. Okay? What is... The formula for the volume of a cylinder. Pi r squared for the circle, and then I'm going to go h for the height, how far up I'm going. Okay, so the volume of my first cylinder, the furthest one left right along the y-axis, is going to be found from pi times my radius squared. Well, my radius, so r squared, 
would be square root of 36 minus x squared squared. And so r squared is really just 36 minus x squared. And so I'm going to have 36 minus x squared. Okay, so x squared I'm going to be looking at because I'm starting right here at the origin and it's a left endpoint that I'm working with. I'm going to have my x value is 0. Okay, because I'm going from 0 is where it's starting out. That's the left side of that first cylinder that I'm working with. So 0 squared times the height. What is the height of this cylinder? Or what am I thinking about when I think of height? Jacob says 1. That makes sense? Okay. Because remember, the height of my cylinder is really the width of my rectangle. And so it has 6. It's from 0 to 6 in 6 subintervals. So there's 6 cylinders going on. So each one has to be a width of one. Okay, so the volume of the first one would just be 36 pi. The volume of the second one would be pi times 36 minus what? One. Okay, because the left side of the next cylinder is at x equals one. One squared times the width which is 1. And so this would be 35 pi. So you'll need to continue this, v3, v4, v5, v6, all of those, add those all together, and that tells you your answer, which is the same thing as s sub 6, s meaning just sum, the sum of all the 6 cylinders, that's what they mean by s sub 6. So s sub 6 will be all of those added together. Okay, now I'll tell you for this one, it ends up being 161 pi. Once you add all of those together, okay? But it's going to be, you're just going to continue on with the pattern. 0 squared, 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, 5 squared, 6 squared. Or not 6 squared, 5 squared will be the last one because the left side of my cylinder. Okay, so that's part A of this problem. Part B, and this is the last part, <clears throat> express the absolute value of the volume minus the sum of those six. The, it was really, the, V stands for, V is our actual volume, S sub six was our approximated volume. So the absolute value of our actual volume minus our approximated volume as a percentage of V. Okay, so what we're going to do is take the actual volume and then subtract our approximated volume. We're going to take the absolute value of that to see how far off we were as a percentage of volume, so as a percentage divided by the actual volume. Does anybody know the volume of a sphere? Four thirds, good. Pi r cubed. And so the actual volume for this one would be five, four thirds times six cubed, which ends up being 288 pi. Okay. So this is the actual volume of a sphere, but we only have half. And so we're divide that in two. And so we have 144 pi is our actual volume of this. So filling into our formula, we'd have our actual 144 pi subtract our approximated, which was 161 pi, 
all divided by the actual, which was 144 pi. Work that all out, we get 0 0.118056, and it keeps going from there. But we want it as a percentage to the nearest percent, and so I will say this is approximately 12%. Okay, so this is, like I said, I think it's number six on your homework. Okay, you'll have different numbers, but that's how you do this. So this one's a little bit different because it's like a three-dimensional shape. And so it was worth going over this one. So 5.1 is in Math Excel. Due Sunday by midnight. I think it's nine problems maybe. Um, so you should be able to get those done without a problem.